we like to have these fun sessions every once in a while where we watch some clips or some movies back to back or something that kind of help get us clearer about our mind and awakening and really come closer to that point of complete involuntary non-judgment, which is what the point of all mind training is about. And um, so I was watching these clips, was it yesterday? And then Francis watched them with me, and then we had a nice little discussion, but we thought we would just share it with all of you. Um, it reminds me, throughout history, especially of the ancient Greeks, you know, they would sit around in the pools and have these wide open, free-ranging discussions where you could bring up any topic. And I'm sure they didn't have video clips back then, but they, they certainly had an atmosphere of openness, and I think that in terms of A Course in Miracles, there's ten characteristic of a teacher of God from doing all this mind training with Jesus. And the last one, he said, perhaps the last one to come in is open-mindedness. Isn't that interesting? The final characteristic to be, imagine to have a free and open mind mm -hmm. where you could just take in everything from a delightful space of, oh, just of the unification of all that's underneath this world. And these kind of clips, uh, I think, are, are helpful for that because there are some real passionate people in here that really are loyal to their belief systems and loyal to trying to follow with what they believe is helpful for themselves and others. And, and then when you kind of juxtapose them, um, some of these are just classic, especially like the ones where they're sit, like having a round table discussion. And uh, one of them has Joel Osteen, who's the pastor of the largest church in uh, the United States, and Deepak uh, <laughs> is, is on that one. He doesn't say anything, but, but it's just interesting. Um, when you bring together people of different faiths, uh, we did watch a movie a while back, it was called Decoding Deepak. <laughs> And his son was kind of poking at him, like, because he would go on some of these shows and, and kind of get engaged with the questions and answers and, and could get a little fired up. And these ministers are definitely fired up, but uh, I just see it as a good discernment lesson for all of us and maybe we'll have some very nice insights, mm -hmm. like we had at After Kumari, mm -hmm. that movie. I think there's three clips we're going to show. The first one is more about uh, Christian ministers commenting on another Christian ministers, Christ, uh, Christian minister. And the second one is a Christian pastor addressing his congregation, basically. And the third one is this Christian minister talking to people of different faiths. And it's just funny to see the impossibility of trying to channel God's law or words into this world of mm -hmm. form and then everybody was trying to prove that they're wrong or they're right one way or the other but it's a lot of fun so we thought we could have a very lively discussion afterwards yeah. see what was going to bring up yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. so sit back and enjoy <laughs> i wish they'd showed me clips like this when i was growing up in the christian church it could have been a mind expanding experience because i'd had a lot of questions what about, what about, what about, you know, and that would have opened up a lot more discussions, but, but we're always in favor of anything that brings the mind to healing. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the different views expressed and then the intensity of the expression, I think it's all helpful in the sense of it, if it just brings you back more and more to the point of like I've said, um, hi, my name is so-and-so, and I have a perceptual problem. If you, if you start to feel whatever you feel, and it may trigger memories of, like you said, being in front of people and those kind of public questions and inquiries, or, or just any kind of discomfort with any aspect of it, then that's like bringing it back to the mind of just like, Really, the awakening can only occur if there's first an admission 
about being wrong about distorted perception. As long as you are seeing the world in terms of people with private minds and private thoughts and private motivations and ambitions for the future and past regrets and all that that seems to be the everyday human way of looking at the world, what seems to be the basic status quo of the filter, you know, there has to come an admission of, I've been mistaken, or that, that is not, that way of perceiving has never brought peace of mind. And therefore there must be another way, you know, there must be something else, and I think that's, that's where the helpfulness begins. As everyone knows in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was saying, judge not lest you be judged, but there's also a line in the Course where Jesus says, without judgment are all things equally acceptable. So, you can think about everything that parades across consciousness, and it's just the divisiveness and the fragmentation in the mind that is where this fear and discomfort comes in. And without judgment are all things equally acceptable. That sounds a lot like all things work together for good. There are no exceptions, Jesus says, except in the ego's judgment. Or that all things be exactly as they are. There's many ways of saying it. Um, everything that seems to happen to me I ask for and receive as I have asked. They're all pointing to this unified state of awareness. It's, not, it's very, very lovely, sounds wonderful, but then it comes down to trusting that if you don't start picking things apart and, and judging things, that that'll, it will be more than safe, that it will be wonderful to be in a state of prior to judgment, prior to the apparent judgments. So, yeah, that was part of our discussion was about seeing, you know, you can't behavior, you couldn't possibly draw a conclusion. Because all the debate, all the opinions is just about which behaviors are right, which behavior is wrong. It's like, I think this, we were listening to your commentary to the lesson this morning. These thoughts do not mean anything. It's like, before these thoughts even were given meaning, there was nothing. There was just maybe you know, fragmented perception, but was meaningless, and that engenders fear, and then the, the mind wants to minimize the fear, so it started to interpret and give meanings to justify its own existence and the meaninglessness of this world. So even all these thoughts, the purpose of it is just, it's not even about any of it in and of itself, it's just to, for such a deeper purpose to try to justify the false, the false. So knowing that, I feel, you know, any of the judgment, any of the thoughts, any of the meaning given to any perception is just, it's all equal. There is no better thoughts or, you know, it's all equal. And I feel like, yeah, just the third clip, just seeing the impossibility of trying to be right in this world, in this perceptual world, trying to say what is God, what is God in this, in this fragmented reality, what is God's will, what is God's law here, how you behave, you know, it's just impossible, because I feel that even with the Course, a lot of people are actually caught in that kind of same confusion as well, like it's all about behavior, it's like even with the metaphysics in the course, the, f the most natural way is to be applied to behavior level and saying, am I doing it right or am I doing it wrong and which one is right and which one is wrong, and just, you know, it's like it's so much deeper what is what is truly given by Jesus is so much deeper, you know, and it's only through experience. So it's like, okay, we, we watch this, 
and what our mind wants to engage. And I, you know, even notice this mind wants to know whether Oprah was right or wrong. You know? <laughs> it's, it's just wanting to find something in this world, the temptation of trying to give meaning to this world. And it's so much deeper that we're asked to let, let it all go, like really trying to leave lift beyond that there is any meaning in this world, there is any meaning in any opinion whatsoever, and come to an experience. It's so fragmented, like God wants this way, this way, this specific way that I can summarize in language, and if this particular thing is right, and anything else is wrong, it's like, Wow, that talking about bring truth to the illusion. But when I watched the second clip, I actually feel, I don't know, I felt something with them. I actually felt something. That maybe it's just the radical, how radical the message is and how we need to not compromise anything like it's there's a, a very deep uncompromise that's been called upon I I can feel with that pastor actually but when he actually specify things in a very concrete term and saying this is red it's like oh uh, but there's something spirit behind it I can feel it <laughs> Yeah, just starting to see the reflections. Anything that will take the mind into this place of just seeing, oh, I'm just perceiving what I'm believing, you know, it, it just, or I'm just seeing reflections of, of thoughts. Like today, I got up early in the morning, 4.35, to, to do the reading from the Course, and then the workbook lesson, and the workbook lesson I read was number four. Um, these thoughts do not mean anything. And then um, later in the day, I think later in the morning, I looked at my news feed and it was um, Oprah Super Soul Sunday welcomes Eckert. Mm. And I was like, oh, I wonder what their topic is. So I clicked on that and it was the studio audience had written in to Oprah to ask Eckert a question. And the question was, um, how do I still the voices in my mind? Mm. Was it, I just saw, same thing. Yeah, it was an interesting reflection. I haven't heard of him being on Super Soul Sunday for mm. the longest time. Apparently he wasn't. And then just on that lesson, that was a reflection mm. today. But if you start to take everything as a reflection of your mind, then it starts to take it out of that context of whether it's judged good or bad or right or wrong or helpful or unhelpful. It's like those are pointless questions, ultimately, if, if everything you perceive is a reflection of your mind, you're just getting what you're asking for. And that's how it works, the mind is so powerful, it just sends out, like, it, look, it calls, it draws forth witnesses, and if you start agreeing and disagreeing with the witnesses, then you're still denying that it's all just your thoughts. And if you start to bring it all the way back to mind, then the real question comes down to who am I serving, or what is my purpose, or what is my goal? You know, you, at a mind level, you see how that starts to simplify everything, that's where you can focus the practice. Mm. What am I aligned with? What am I serving? What, what purpose do I hold forth? And it takes the whole looking to the world for for answers and meaning, it just, it just pulls the plug on that. Yeah. I remember that movie Joe versus the Volcano, where 
Joe finally makes it to, I think it's California, and he meets this, the uh, Meg Ryan character that says she's a Liberty Jew. But uh, he's talking to her. They're, they're sitting in a car, and they're out in the evening and everything, and I think, and she's there with him, and he's talking, maybe it's that, or maybe it's at a dinner table or something, but he says something, and she says, I have absolutely no response to that. And I thought, hmm, that's an interesting line. I have absolutely no response to that. But it would, ultimately, it's where is it coming from? If it comes from a, a place of clarity where you see that basically you have no response, good or bad or right or wrong to anything, then that's where you start to realize it's, it's not outside. There's no need to justify, respond. Think of all the energy and time that goes into taking the side or justifying something, explaining something. How many of us have grown up and we've had somebody come up in our face and say, explain yourself. And we're like, <laughs> like we really believe we have to, <laughs> or that it's necessary, you know, but to come to a deeper state of mind where there's, there is no needing to justify things or explain, just to come into guidance, living a guided life, living an inspired life without any justifications or explanations. And it's mind training, you can tell, even around here we talk about no people pleasing, no private thoughts, that's our guidelines to help things come up and out, but, but even in terms of, of guidance or expression sessions or anything like that, you know, it's, you really get to look at if there's any thoughts or reactions that go on in the mind, and if there is a, like a reactive thought or, or a react reaction in terms of an emotional sense, then it's like, huh, you could just note and chalk it up to, oh, I still, I still must believe in externals. Why would I be concerned. Why would it be upset about something that was said or done, or a rule, you can do this, you can't do this? Why would I even care unless I still had a faith in the external, unless I still was looking out to the world for meaning, and wanting to make sure I get it right. Did I get it right? What did they say? Is it, mm -hmm. you know, if there's still that kind of concern, then that's what's getting rinsed, yeah. rinsed away, washed away. Yeah. yeah, we have someone from China who just who met us like a few years ago and then she just sent a Skype message recently, a couple of days ago, and saying, is, is, your, is David's teaching still no private thoughts and no people pleasing or is there anything new? <laughs> and, and we talked about it and we said, you know, no private thoughts and no people pleasing is a start and the next one is no private mind. That's, that's, that's what it is, like that's where it's leading to, no private mind. And that is the experience of there is no external, you know, and to see that is, if there's anything is out of this desire to still be small, and still be, you know, something that is separated from the external world, mm -hmm. and then everything else is put onto that desire interpretation and being a victim and all that, but that's, that's where we're heading. No private thoughts, no people pleasing, no private minds. No private minds, meaning there's only one mind and there's no world apart from that mind. Because we, I went out there just to sit while they were finishing up on lunch and at the very end I pulled out my iPhone and I, I showed this little clip from Facebook of these two women who had a, like a camera, and then like a, a timer on the camera, so they, they had probably set it up, they pushed the, the timer thing, like the, so they could run and get into the photo. And so you can see the two women running in slow motion towards this rock. They're going to both run, it's very slow motion, they run into the rock, and then they, they jump on the rock, and then they kind of Hold, hold arms, and then they are posing for the, 
the thing to go off and then just before the the, the picture takes you know because it's it's all actually like a video so it's just instead of being a, it shows the dog one of their dogs jumping up and his face goes over the whole <laughs> screen <laughs> and then after that it goes off and then it's just got blank thing and it says Amy who was one of the women Amy had the thought of photo bombing you know somebody tries to Bomb a photo. Amy had the thought of photo bomb, hmm. which I, I thought there it is again. It's just a little quantum mm -hmm. teaching on Facebook that that it wasn't. It was, if it's supposed to be funny that the dog jumped in and and blocked the the shot, you could barely see the two women in the back by the rock because the dog's very innocent looking face is looking into the camera, and that's mainly what you see. But that thought of the Amy had a thought about photobombing. That was just showing the quantum that everything's just a thought. You know, it's not like the two women had thoughts of their minds of their own, and the dog had a mind of his own. It was just a thought of pho photobombing, mm -hmm. and that was a, an, a representation and an interpretation of a photobombing. Mm -hmm. That's why they always say, "Be careful what you pray for." You know, because the mind is so powerful and it's just constantly imagining things and and it's always receiving whatever messages it's sending, whatever it is thinking and believing, it's perceiving. And that's the whole point of A Course in Miracles workbook, is to show you that the, that the thoughts that you think you think, and the world that you think you see, are not different. But there's not a, a private mind that has these little thoughts whirling around and a giant external cosmos that is outside. Thoughts and images, but my thoughts are images I have made. That's one of his early connecting lessons where he starts off with perception, perception lessons, and he comes in with a thought lesson, then back to more perception lessons, with some feelings thrown in, and then back to thought. But the whole point of the 365 lessons, the workbook, is just to see that there's no world apart from what you think, or ultimately that these aren't real thoughts, these imagination thoughts aren't real thoughts, and the world that they seem to show, the images, are not real either. But the identity of being a human requires that you believe you have your own private mind, distinct from other minds, and very distinct from the world. Hiroshima, a nuclear detonation goes off. You know, it's like, ooh, everyone's watching on their little TV sets, seeing this mushroom cloud go up, but when you start to apply the Course, my thoughts are images I have made, you start to, to realize that, there, that nothing in the perceived world is actually happening. It's just an experience of these unreal thoughts that the sleeping mind is having, believing that there are externals. That's, that's why people why are children a little concerned when they go to a brand new school and have to meet new teachers, a new principal, new classmates? There's a little anxiety, there's an anxiousness there with meeting new people, new people, not known people, new ones. It's, and then even in the ones that are known, you know, more homicides take place within families of those known ones, those loved ones, <laughs> turn out to be the murderers. <laughs> There's more homicides that occur in those kind of contexts. The emotions are so highly charged, but it's the sense that, that there's a self and there's others. And that there's an inner and an outer even, even more deeply in there. There's this distinction between an inner and an outer. So that's really what the whole thing is pointing for, it, it, towards is that it's all one mind and there are no 
thoughts apart, there's no world apart from what you think, there's, there are no people apart from what you think, that people are not really autonomous individuals with their own private minds and private thoughts, but they're actually, they're, they're thoughts, they're, they are thoughts. Next time you're concerned about having somebody, losing somebody in your life, you might just remember this, they're a thought in your mind, they're still in your mind. They can't go anywhere. You can't, you can't really lose something if, if you're holding on and still thinking of them. You know, sometimes people say, oh, I, I, they're gone now, they, they died. But, but there's still the thought, the thoughts and the memories, like the Solaris movie, you know. The psychologist Chris Calvin, you know, played by George Clooney. Uh, his wife has, we find out, committed suicide, but he keeps thinking of her. He's something unresolved. He keeps his memories tortured by the memory of his wife committed suicide, and he keeps thinking of her, thinking of her. Then he goes up to near this planet Solaris, where it's kind of a symbolizing, you know, that, that what you sow, so shall you reap, and giving and receiving are the same in the divine law. So not only is he thinking of her, he's dreaming about her, and not only is he thinking about her and dreaming about her, but when he goes to bed, his friend up there says, when you go to bed at night, lock your door. That's all, that, that's all he tells him, nothing more. Just, I think I'd lock, lock my door when you go to sleep. So Chris Calvin goes to Solaris, he's thinking of his ex-wife periodically, he's dreaming of her, and then as he's laying there, he's, he seems to be having a dream of her, a vision of her, and then you see this hand come over his shoulder. All you see is this hand, this feminine hand on his shoulder, and, and then he wakes up and he's startled because she's there in bed with him, touching him, thereby violating the belief that the dead and gone are actually dead and gone. That's a belief. Everything is a belief. So she was still very much in his mind, and was still very much unresolved. And as the movie goes on, you know, you start to see that she's, she's like, she's like a memory of what, what he gave to her. You know, that's how Jesus tells us this whole projection works. We're always perceiving our own thoughts and our own beliefs and our own ideas acted out as if they're not us, but it really, it's all the mind. And it's almost a clever way of projecting, like here's an unresolved thought or belief and now, uh -huh, conveniently, now it's acted out as a person, as if they really have an actual existence. But that's not the case. And eventually, he has to come to this very humble experience when Chris Calvin comes back to Earth. You know, he's still haunted by these experiences that he had about her, and you know, he he he's haunted by this idea that I that he says that I remembered her wrong. Remembered her wrong. Mainly that I, I, he held a past memory, a past image of who she was. And that, that wasn't who she really is at all. And then finally she shows up again on Earth. You know, at the end of the movie, everything is forgiven, she says, everything. And she proceeds it by saying, we don't have to think like that anymore. That is huge, to begin to open your mind to the idea that people aren't people. That people are thoughts. And that you aren't really locked into limiting relationships, you're not locked into limiting scenarios, locked, in, you know, locked into these limiting externals, but really it's just the very belief system that believes in the reality of these things. It's taken on like, like a Pinocchio, it's gone from puppets to real people, real men, real women, real boys, real girls. Like, that's the whole story of Pinocchio, going from a puppet to being real. But that's part of the delusion of taking things to be real, real objects, 
that have real existence, and they aren't just thoughts, mm. equally thoughts, everything. Okay, so as I was talking about, she's been listening to audiobooks of Mary Baker Eddy's Science and Health, the Key to the Scriptures and the Urantia book, and just enjoying those, but that's really the thought of Christian science, that's the whole People always say, are there any denominations in Christianity that are like, kind of cool or hip or kind of uh, lined up? I say, Christian science, there's one, <laughs> one out of hundreds, thousands. But, but basically the teaching of that, the symbol of that is that there's no mind and matter, you know, and what does that mean, there's no mind and matter? There's no life, truth, substance, intelligence and matter. You mean there's, there's no such thing as human life? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That is important. <laughs> what about plant life? Nope. Animal life? What about Cecil the lion? Animal life? There must be something about animal life. Nope. Is that radical? Nope. To the ego, yes. But is it radical? Nope. But you know, it's like just to open to that idea would be a revolution in the mind. Talk about healing, that would be a revolution. That your, soon your cares and your worries and concerns would disappear because if it's all mind, all equally mind, then there's no inner, there's no outer. You don't have any more loose ends to wrap up. Mm. What a struggle to wrap those loose ends up. What is that all about? Quantum forgiveness says, no, they're, they're not really there to be wrapped, <laughs> wrapped up. Yeah. So this, this experience, it, you know, it's like, it's more like just opening up to it and saying, wow, that's, show me, show me. Like you were saying, like you were saying at lunch, you know, it was, Suzanne was asking about the movie Mission Impossible and we started to explain it and then it just was like, wait a minute. Almost like I can't answer that question, it's the whole experience is quantum. But if that's the case, then there is no movie. So you find yourself having a difficult time explaining how the movie was, because you like, you started, it's, it's great, 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 great. I'm great. Everything's great. <laughs> you know, you've got to get honest. <laughs> you've got to take it full. All the way. You see, because then it's, you're not trying to dissect or label the parts and give evaluation of the parts, because that's, that's the problem. Believing in the parts. That's really fun. I think it's great, some of these clips are really, <laughs> it's a good springboard. It's like these clips, in a way, they're just a good reminder, like as a contrast, almost like shake the mind up and say, whoa, whoa. It's like somehow in a very quick way, it's just like really, this is, I don't know, like kind of almost like, do you want that, like truly, is there anything attractive about that? Like, oh no, like, almost like, 
could be like a bit of a fear, just like don't want to go back, don't throw me back. It's like okay then. And so it leaves you no choice but mm -hmm. like, but to like show me, just like open up. Like sometimes like, it's, it's and it's better if you see it on the screen like that. Again, it's a time collapse. Let it like let it play out, and then it's like oh, okay, I don't want this. Just like I'm like I show me, but it's like sometimes whatever it takes. And, uh, yeah, and it's uh, it's just a reminder to be so vigilant because I, I was just saying such like this firmness with the mind training. It's kind of like it's such a like it's like a rope. You're walking on the rope. It's like one step away, and you're what's happening? Who am I? Am I this guy or this guy? What am I supposed to watch? And oh, kind of like and the whole outer is there is this kind of like that like all of it is just comes down to purpose what is it for what is it for every communication really what is it for like you know accept the means but a bit of a like the means are real and there's some kind of like real value in it it's like you're back in like in that like it's like what's happening in the matrix so to speak and it's just back to the purpose what is it for what do you do it for you can negate the words but underneath it's like what is it for and just like kind of be so clear and so the reflections are like clear and clear and clear mm -hmm. and so i find every so often to watch something like that it's just helpful to snap so quickly into like show me show me i like i really like you know you keep one judgment or one preference this guy is better than the other and you keep the whole thing, it's like you're in there, it's just like, it's like, please show me, like, please, just like, it sounds like there's no other way. Mm -hmm. What's the truth? So. Yeah. That's right, if we have any judgment about anything, reality, then a clip like that, that counters that. And you feel, oh, it's mm -hmm. like the mind is still in the right and wrong, like it's still in the specifics. And the calling for us is really just going beyond that. Like we're not to be right either. And we are just to release, a constantly release, release everything we know. That feels helpful actually. Sometimes there's something just so different than the course and just come in and it's like, okay, I think I know the truth. And it's not so either. Yeah, there's a line in the Bible that said, All things work together for good for those who love the Lord. I would say, for those who are aligned with the Lord, all things work together for good. All things work together for good. And then in the Course, Jesus kind of further clarifies the Bible. He, he says, All things work together for good. Same line from the Bible. There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment, but there are no exceptions. So all things work together for good, there are no exceptions. So, but that could only be realized if you see that it's all mind. That it's all mind. That there actually is nothing physical. I mean, and that's a question I get a lot, is all about levels and, well there's the horizontal level and the physical level and this and this and this, but what if everything is mind? Everything is equally mind. Jesus does say that in the Course. He said, this is a world of ideas. He calls it a world of ideas. It's just an interesting phrase, world of ideas. He doesn't say there's physical ideas and there's spiritual ideas. You know, you have to start to see that that's what right-mindedness or the unified field is all about. Is that it's all ideas and it's all equally ideas. So, if that's the case, why, how could you react to some and not to others? Or react to some ideas positively and others negatively, if they're all equally ideas in mind? That's just, that's what consciousness is. But there's nothing physical. It reminds me a lot, too, of some of those teachings in the Bible. I remember, you know, they had, we had the Old Testament, we had the Ten Commandments, and the, 
you know, then the new covenant comes along, Jesus comes along really to clarify the commandments, basically says the first two of all the commandments are the most important. That's nice, that helps a bit. From ten to two, that's good. Give me the two most important ones. But then, some of the stuff that he said, people would be like, what are you talking about? And one of them I was thinking of the other day was, one of the Ten Commandments is, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, that's one of the commandments. Then Jesus comes along, and he starts off with, Verily, verily, I tell you the truth. If a man has a lustful thought for a woman, not his wife, he commits adultery. Well, what just happened? We just went from the behavioral level of some body cheating on another body to the thought level. If a man has a lustful thought for a woman not his wife, he commits adultery. Jesus came along and said, he just knocked it up to the thought level. The thought level, not the behavioral level. People will be like reading that in the Bible. Whoa, what is that? You know, or these preachers were talking. The woman was saying, "I don't think Jesus was condemning gays or, you know, this and this." But he had some interesting things about um, purification and eunuchs. He called them and eunuchs for the glory of God and all kinds of. There's a lot of deep mystical teachings. If you go back to the Bible, you start reading the the red letters, it's mystical. <laughs> it's very mystical. And the, all the Course does is he just clarifies it even further. He says, oh yeah, maybe you think it's mystical, but actually it will set you free. The truth will set you free. So he's explaining that, that what is temptation but the wish to make illusions real? It's the wish to have a hierarchy of illusions. That's what temptation is. It's not temptation for chocolate or sex or mm -hmm. alcohol or cigarettes or temptation for specific little things that are talked about. You know, it's, it's the wish to have an identity apart from the one that God created. It's the wish to make a hierarchy of illusions. It's the wish to have orders of difficulty and miracles. That's the first principle. There are no orders of difficulty. In miracles. And yet, you start to see how deep the rabbit hole goes, and how he's calling, you know, in the Bible it is, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. In the Course it's, miracles are everyone's right, but purification is necessary first. He's still coming with the same words. He's calling, this deep calling to awaken to your true reality. And it all fits together. It's all very, 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 very mystical. But it's just what we're talking about here. It's just that it's all equally ideas in the mind. And the ego has just divided things up into what's mind and what's matter. And what's good and what's bad, what's right and what's wrong. And you can see the debate. All it is, is a fragmented mind that's seeing witnesses of fragmentation. Mm -hmm. And at some point it has to dawn, wait a minute, that's right, all things work together for good. There are no exceptions. Wow, there are no exceptions. And he covers that in so many ways, like the early lessons. I haven't got to them, but I'm just about ready to get to them in my progression. But. Um, he comes out with one of his lessons, um, you do not perceive your own best interest. That's an interesting lesson. I do not perceive my own best interest. It's profound enough, but you'd think he'd leave it there, but then his next lesson, he says, everything is for your best interest. <laughs> Holy moly! It's it's mystifying enough that I do not perceive my own best interests. Well, I can tell from my emotional roller coaster, right? Maybe he's right. But then what? What did you say in the next lesson? Everything. 
That's a big word. When Jesus says everything, he usually means everything. <laughs> everything is for your best interest. Hmm, sounds a little bit like all things work together for good. Sounds a little bit like let all things be exactly as they are. How deep that is, how profound. He's basically saying nothing has ever gone wrong. Ever. It's a step to, it never happened. It's to say it's all gone right. <laughs> everything's gone right. Well, if everything's gone right, that means there's not been a single tragedy. Not even a single one. A single victimization. A single misinterpretation. It's all, all a state of mind. It's all pointing to a state of mind. And that's just like a, a surrender of, okay, this is my life, this is my devotion, this is the only thing that I could ever truly come to know, so I might as well be open to being shown. You know, we say well, it's, it's the only game in town, the only game available is the happy game of non-judgment. So, that's an invitation to the happy game. Good stuff. The goal of the curriculum, Jesus says, regardless of the teacher you choose, is know thyself. There is nothing else to seek. He's weaving in the ancient Greeks, know thyself, he's weaving in right in. There is nothing else to seek. So, this is a, a realm, a world where it's, even you could hear the minister call him seeker, seeker friendly, <laughs> seeker friendly, <laughs> seeker friendly. <laughs> but, but you know, everyone who seems to come to this world is, is a seeker, by definition. But, so we're still left with, seek and ye shall find, knock and the door shall be opened, or the ego's plan for salvation. I don't think the ego would sit back without offering a plan for salvation. <laughs> Seek and do not find. That's, that's the ego's plan. So you can tell whether you're in line with God's plan or the ego's plan by whether you're finding or not. <laughs> if you're not finding, <laughs> by definition, you're following the imposter. And if you're more in amazing grace, I once was lost, but now in town. And that's where the amazing grace comes in. You're found in, in the Lord's plan, in the Holy Spirit's plan of salvation. That was interesting, that one clip that was in there about Oprah when she was talking about there are, are many ways to God. It was so funny because I remember it was one of those moments where the Holy Spirit said, turn the TV on right now. I said, now? And I turned it on and it was Oprah and it was that particular show. I watched a little Oprah here and there, but not like regularly, but 
that show, and I thought, and I sat down. <laughs> Holy Spirit says, now sit down, because I was just, I turned on Oprah and I saw this big, heated um, exchange going on. And the Holy Spirit said, now sit down on the couch. So I moved back and sat down and watched the show. But, yeah, they got into the, the whole discussion was about opening about spirituality and pathways to God. And Oprah was basically making her point that there are many pathways to God. And then that little clip we saw there was someone in the audience contesting her and saying, Oh no, Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way to get You saw the woman on there. And after that woman said that, it was like an explosion of energy hit the whole um, TV set, you know, the, where, she, where she was. And the camera started to like shake. It, it totally started to go into entropy, started to move to chaos. I've never seen an Oprah show where they hit on such, they've hit some, I'm going to watch Jerry Springer and, I mean, you see people hitting each other and chasing each other, but, but I mean, the whole audience, they, they had touched upon a, a deep nerve about whether there's one way to God or there's multiple ways, and, and then the, um, I remember I sat there and watched, and, and it just, people started shouting from the audience, and the camera started shaking, and I thought, wow, this is, this place looks like it's going to explode. And then at one point, they, you know how Oprah is with her, she has to get her commercials in. <laughs> she, in the middle of this, they're in the most charged thing, the cameras are shaking, and probably somebody in her tech team motioned to her, we need to take, you have to take a commercial break. It doesn't matter if the whole studio is going to explode. <laughs> You've got to get the commercials in there. So, I remember they they swirled over to, move the camera over to Oprah, and she said, Jesus, if you're there, help us! And they cut. That's what they cut to the commercial with, was Oprah screaming into the camera, Jesus, if you're there, help us! They <laughs> cut to a nice, calm commercial. And so I watched. And then, as Oprah would frequently do, after she let it, Go with studio audience and everything. They get they save the last 25 minutes or so to bring on the panel of experts. <laughs> I'm like, oh god! <laughs> well, I just watch this thing because they just almost swirled out of control with the, the audience. Now they bring them, and they had all these religious leaders like a rabbi and a priest. They had a row of all these religious leaders there, and then Oprah started to open up the whole thing to the religious, the panel of experts. I, I thought it was fascinating. I thought, well, what am I watching this for? You know, I'm obviously turned this on, told to turn it on for a reason. So as I watched the panel of experts, the panel of experts got into it really good, just like the audience. They, this was like, like a magnet, and they started going. But there was one guy that was in the middle of the panel of experts, that had the biggest smile on his face, and never spoke one word. He just sat in the middle, he would go, <laughs> and he was just the most glorious. It was almost, that was what the Holy Spirit said, now watch the guy, watch him, and watch the guy in the middle. And he was just, he never spoke a single word, but he was in total love and agreement with the whole audience, and with both sides of him, the panel. But no word was spoken, so it was a very powerful experience, because that's pointing at what we're talking about, about all things work together for good. There's no point in, in taking a side, because there are no sides. God didn't create sides. God is a God of oneness. God doesn't create duality. There are no sides in heaven. And that's the lesson, that's the one lesson we have, is to start to see that we can never take a side because there aren't a side. That will also take you out of this idea of politics. It will also take you out of this idea of settling an argument. Like, what argument, really? Ultimately, how can, where is the argument? If your mind, if it's all mind, and everything's equally ideas, there aren't sides, and you start to 
see not that you're praying for an end to conflict, but you are coming into an experience of the impossibility of conflict, which must be forgiveness. If you have an actual experience, an actual experience that there's no conflict, that's glorious. That's truly the point of everything. That's the point of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. That's the point of A Course in Miracles. It's the point of science and health. It's key to the scriptures. It's all aimed at one experience. So it's, that's really what it's about. An experience will come that will end your doubting, he says. He doesn't say a theology will come that will end your doubting. He doesn't say a belief system will come that will end your doubting. He says an experience will come that will end your doubting. And that's amazing. <laughs>